Okay, so remember in the previous, so we're going to do the last few statements on the ribbon and uh, uh, today and then uh, start some uh, modular functions and then we'll see. So the uh, remember that we took a graph G and then we took uh, the uh, Z mod 2N times G. So here for E6, for instance, this is 2N is equal to uh, 24 here. So after 24 levels, 0, 1, and this should be considered the same as 0, 0, 1, 2. And uh, we had found that the, uh, that the simple roots were here on 0 and on level n minus 1. The other three. So these were the simple roots. And that the essential pass from here and from the simple roots downwards from the top. So these are, this is fusion. This one is fusion upwards. And this one is downwards. And this, this gives us uh, the, um, fundamental weights. And uh, it was a, an observation of uh, Zhang Wei that uh, during my, uh, at the end of my uh, proof, that uh, it, the thing could be simplified, consider, uh, that one step of that proof, at least one step, could be simplified by noticing the following. If you have here a root, then the uh, entries, so you have the root, then the entries of the fusion above are exactly the inner product, if you have a root A, are the inner product of A with each uh, AI, where these are the simple roots. In other words, you look here at this root, and you check for each of these. The fusion up, the fusion. So you have each of those is a dual, linear dual of a root. So the number that you see there will be the coefficient of, the, um, of that root in the simple basis. So these are the are uh, the coefs, and this is wrong here, uh, not AAI, but they are AAI, AI uh, dual, so this is a dual, and these are the coefficients, please adjust here, of A in the simple basis. And uh, now you can see directly from this picture that uh, the coefficients are all positive. You see all between this and this. Yes? Because fusion has positive coefficients. So uh, this means that all coefs are bigger than or equal to zero uh, in between 
in uh, the half of the ribbon. between the simple roots. Yes? So this is exactly half the ribbon, 0 to n minus 1. And from here, you start again from n to minus 1. Yes, that's the other half, and the coefficient there will be all negative. That's a remarkable thing about the uh, the root systems that all the coefficients of uh, uh, of roots are either positive or negative, all positive or negative. Now, uh, another observation with which I was completing my proof was the fact that uh, the uh, the roots. And the fusion from I A roots the root of I A and the fusion of I A are biharmonic in I A. So that means that the sum, that the sum this way of two roots equal to the sum this way of the neighbors. of neighbor roots horizontally. And I should also uh, show you, oh, the proof of this is immediate. Let's say for the roots, root I A um, in a product with J B is biharmonic in JB. The fusion was biharmonic. That was a fundamental property of this. So it was a sum of fusion, a sum of fusion. Fusions and, but this, but this is equal to I A root of J B. The inner product here, the fusion is symmetric in in its two two arguments. So uh, this means simply that uh, the sum of the neighbors of root of JB has the same inner product with every element. Yes? Very good. So this is uh, one. And uh, let me show you just to, to show you how the ribbon goes. Uh, I should show you the, uh, the ribbon for the case A. So this is a ribbon for the case uh, uh, A3. This is a graph A3. And uh, well, let me tell you one more theorem, and then we'll identify it with this. These are the roots of type A3. So it's quite nice, but it has a twist. So uh, you can make yourself the pictures. And uh, the pictures are like this. The best way, let me show you how to do it correctly. 
Uh, you take, you draw very faintly a cube, and then you take the middles of its uh, edges. These are the roots of type A3. So you should know the And with this one, we'll work a lot in the higher math. This is the uh, so the um, convex hull. of the of roots is called the root solid and we'll work a lot with it uh, now the root of type a a3 if you remove a point, that's one of the fundamental operations in uh, Coxeter systems. If you remo remove a point, becomes what root system? A2 in two of the cases, yes. And can you see where's the root of A2 here? It's a hexagon, thank you. So, so you can see here a hexagon like this. Yes, this is the root of A2. And there should be also one uh, other thing. If you remove this, then what would that be? Yes, yes. Hmm? A1 squared, right? So this should be a kind of uh, A1, the roots of A1 are a pair of things, yes? So this should be a square. Yes, so this is one of these squares. You should recognize it visually. So this should be one of these squares. Yes, which are at 90 degrees. Any questions? So, um, let's... Uh, Prove now something. It's good that uh, that uh, uh, James came because he gave us once uh, a nice uh, homework. The only homework I have received, but then I didn't assign many. Um, and it was about uh, it, it had in it the the uh, coxet element. So let me show you the coxet element. So this is the last. Uh, so theorem. Uh, if we choose, so I will define the coxet element first. Let me define it here. So the uh, the coxet element is uh, the product of reflections. in, as usual, the hyperplanes, hyperplanes perpendicular to a set of simple roots in some order. 
So it depends on the set and on the order. And there's a fundamental result in, uh, in the theory of Hermann Weyl of, uh, of these uh, Coxeter elements that uh, the Coxeter the coxet element is unique up to conjugacy by reflections. So the the vial group is generate is a group generated by by reflections. For instance, uh, reflections in the simple root suffice. If you uh, if you repeat them, in the case of uh, AN, the viral group is a permutation group. So we won't have time. You should you encourage to read this from a classical book on uh, uh, on um, uh, Lie algebras, but uh, we should identify the Coxet element here, and this is a theorem. If uh, we uh, uh, choose a simple roots, n minus 1 uh, on rows, on two rows, n minus 1 apart on the ribbon, and define the coxet element by taking the product of reflections separate separately on each row and then multiply so if you have your your uh, simple roots divided into two rows then you can on a given row the the inner product between roots is zero so on that row, the, the product of the reflections commutes. So this is one way to get, yes. Then, here's a conclusion, then the uh, Coxet element moves the ribbon by two vertically, uh, moves, translates vertically. So the shift down the ribbon here, if you take a root, you move it down by two, this is a coxet element which also shows this way that the coxet element to the power n is the identity. Coxet element, let's put it capital cox, because we use this for the number. Cox to the n is the identity. Yes, which is a fundamental property of the coxet element. So, uh, And uh, 
in the classical theory, the exponents, this was the, uh, the correlation found by, by uh, James. So in the classical theory, the exponents appear as, uh, appear from the eigenvalues of the uh, Coxet element. Yes. So, um, but let's let's prove this uh, theorem. The let's take two consecutive rows. Let's call these A I and these ones B J. So these are, let's say, simple roots. And these would be then the negative of simple roots. Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for Please always tell me such things. Very good. So this is a good moment to magnify it. Very good. So and we'll also rearrange the thing with this. So let's call these now the negatives of simple roots. And these would be simple roots. on two consecutive rows. Remember that you have the simple roots and then you have n minus one rows below. They are also simple roots. So these will be the negatives of these ones. There will be one half ribbon up. Yes? And let's call these, uh, I don't know, AIs and these ones BJs. And now notice the following. Uh, they are, uh, so if you, the angle between them is uh, AI inner with BJ is equal to one if uh, IJ are neighbors, if AI, BJ are neighbors. That is connected by an edge and uh, zero elsewhere. So that's because of the definition of the roots. We had some fusion here. And uh, so the neighbors have always one. That's why, actually, if you remember, that's why we had to take to move one of them half the ribbon away because the inner product was one, not negative one, as it should be for roots. Yes? So that's why these are negatives of roots. So they're at 60 degrees. Now, if you have uh, uh, something like this, uh, this is an AI BJ. These are neighbors. Here, the, it's one six of a circle. And uh, now, if you take the reflection in uh, the reflection in uh, I don't know BJ, for instance, this is a hyperplane perpendicular to BJ, so the reflection in BJ of AI is equal to this one, which is AI minus. BJ. So, so this means that uh, the product of the reflections in BJ of uh, the product of uh, all J's of AI 
is equal to AI minus the sum of neighbors. BJ, BK, let's say, of AI. Now, since we proved that the roots were, uh, that the roots were uh, biharmonic, it means that the sum of neighbors, so if this is AI, the sum of neighbors is exactly AI, this will be AI plus AI prime, where this is AI shifted by two. Yes, the sum vertically is the same as the sum horizontally, right? So this means that the sum of the neighbors, AI minus uh, sum of the neighbors of AI, this is the negative of, uh, of uh, AI prime. Yes. And the product, the same product, or BK is negative BK. So this means that uh, the, uh, the product of the reflections in BJ shifts the A's by two, and then since the shifted A's and B's and all B's, to their negatives. So then it is clear that applied then to the product of the A prime i's, which is, so let me, move it down here so you can see, apply then to the product of the reflections in AI prime, in my, in AI prime, which is equal to, in AI, which is a product, uh, so, uh, Okay, no, so, uh, well, l let's, let's leave it to the fact rather than, uh, uh, right, uh, let's leave it to the fact that this, applying this transformation twice gives you exactly a shift by two. Yes, so this is a shift by, one of them is shifted by one, then both are sent to the negative. And remember that the reflection in a negative is the same as the reflection in the, in the original one, that's because you reflect in the hyperplane perpendicular to it, yes? And another theorem now, that's what we want here. Um, the choice, this is a fundamental one, although it doesn't seem so, maybe at first sight, but uh, when you work with it, you'll see. The choice of uh, Coxet element determines the, uh, 
let's put it here very carefully because it's a fundamental property, determines, uh, rather, let's say, organizes the roots into a ribbon on which the coxet element is translation by two. uniquely up to translation. So the roots have a lot of symmetry, the wire group. The roots on the ribbon have this symmetry broken, uh, partly. I mean, a lot of symmetry is kept, but the symmetry is broken in the sense where we have organized them in a ribbon. And the data for organizing them in a ribbon is exactly the choice of a coxet element among the many. Once you have chosen the coxet element, then the ribbon is uniquely determined except for a starting point on the ribbon. Now, I have thought uh, long about uh, various proofs of this, and all of them are kind of ad hoc and uh, rather annoying, so we are going to uh, make here the proof. Is observational and we're, we need uh, the actual uh, inner product of roots now. Let's see the window here with the roots, which is not this. Uh, just a moment. Roots, roots, uh, roots AD, I think this is the one. So the question is what, what information do you have if you have this coxet element? So let's write it here, info from, so this is part of the proof, that observational info from a given coxet element. Is are the orbits. I think I should uh, choose another, just one more moment. So this was roots, roots AD poster. I think this one should do. And it was open. So this is, oh, and I must unmute the image. Yes. Are the orb, are its orbits. So we take a point, we take a root, and we apply the coxet element to it. Yes? This gives us its orbits, which are z mod uh, n, because the coxet element has, uh, has uh, order n. And now, please look, uh, look uh, here. The statement is the following days. The, uh, if you take the... Uh, point on the longest leg of the Dunkin diagram. 
So take, for instance, this is a Dunkin diagram, E, uh, uh, this is a D. Let's take an E, for instance, an E7 here, yes? So the roots here, are, this is just half the roots, half of the roots, yes? The point with the black uh, uh, dot, uh, so this is the inner product of a root with the other roots, yes? That's exactly what we had been computing. So the inner product with itself is two, with this one is negative one, so if the color is different, is negative one, yes. With all these is one, yes. And the observation now is the following. Take the, for instance here, the longest leg of, se of E7, yes. And uh, you can see, you, you can take a root and take the inner products of that root with all the uh, other elements on its orbit, yes? So this is a pattern that you'll get. With itself, it's two. With this one, it's negative one in this case, yes? Then a couple of zeros. So remember, what you have is a coxet element. The coxet element moves you downwards, yes? So you start a point, and you start to take the inner product of that shifted point of that point with its shifts, yes? With the coxet element, coxet element again, you'll get exactly the pattern on the left where we should uh, go here like this, yes? So you'll get the pattern here on the left. Do you see two with itself, minus one with the uh, next, then a couple of zeros, then plus one again, minus one, and so on. There is no other vertex, you see, take, take this vertex, for instance, which has the same pattern of its orbit. So the furthest, you see this one, the inner product with the other elements on its orbit is this, and this is just an observational thing. None of the columns under these, yes, look the same as this one. So conclusion, we can, uh, if we compare it with a ribbon, where we have a coxet element, then uh, we can identify the furthest away column by this pattern. And then this column has a pattern with, among all the others, you see this is with a second column, yes, up to translation. So this is up to translation up and down. Now, this clear? So what you know is a coxet element and the way it acts on orbits. It means that you take a, some root, for instance this one, uh, and you move it downwards, and you take its inner product with your given one. Yes, so you have identified first a, uh, a, uh, uh, the furthest element, then an element which is uh, next to it, and so on. So each of these elements has a different pattern with respect to the, with, uh, with uh, respect to the first one, except when the, uh, when there's a symmetry of the graph, like for the D, the two legs, but then that's a symmetry of the ribbon as well. So this is the observational proof. One could uh, maybe simplify it, make it a little bit more conceptual, but, uh, uh, anyway, that's the one. That's the one I have now. Um, any questions about this? So once again, if you know the coxet element, it means that you know the orbits. Yes, and then you know if you have one element, you take the inner product with the elements on its orbit. You have a nearby. Then you <coughs> excuse me. Then you look at the inner products of this element with each of the other orbits as an orbit. And you see no orbit repeats itself. So this means that uh, knowing the ribbon, you can re-identify the ribbon once you're given the coxet element. It's not uh, maybe a very elegant proof, but, uh, but it's important to notice this. And uh, when you see the... Uh, Universal, the, the canonical basis, which was constructed by Lustig and Kashiwara, 
uh, in the well-written text, there's always a mention that it's uh, actually not entirely canonical, but it's canonical up to the choice of a coxet element. Yes, so uh, after you choose a coxet element, then you can choose a basis. We will not develop this direction further, but uh, other than to mention that there is a fundamental construction that we described at some point when we discussed quivers, namely that you take an essential path, you concatenate it with another essential path, and then you project onto essential paths. Yes, so this is a composition, and uh, using this in principle, one can, uh, one can build uh, all the advanced Lie theory, but we won't do it uh, right now in the course. It might be done in the book. Uh, and uh, one last thing, uh, where's the ribbon here? This is a more fun part, that's why people carry models. Where's the ribbon here and where's the ribbon on, the, uh, on that? So these are, the, uh, these are the roots of type D4, yes? So let's look first at these roots. Uh, what's nice here is that we also have the weights, yes? So um, the coxet element here, so the ribbon should be obtained by holding this, holding two opposite centers and rotating, except for the following. If you take the ribbon, you get a pro, uh, uh, the product of how many reflections here? since this is A3. If you, uh, the coxet element is a product of how many reflections? Three. Three. So it should be a, an orientation changing thing. And the coxet element, I let you compute that, is a rotation by 90 degrees together with a, uh, with a reflection right to left. Yes? And this is exactly what we were mentioning before. The product of two of the rotations, of two of the reflections is a rotation by 90 degrees. And then the, the third one is a reflection right left and it commutes. So, uh, okay, now uh, what it means is that the ribbon goes forward with one square and then the next two elements are switched. So let's uh, write it now. Let's draw it because we started. And So look, it's down, it's up there, and we'll get it down and complete the picture if you haven't made the picture. So let's, uh, let's call these elements A1, A, A plus, A minus, B, C plus, C minus, and now we'll, we'll call it C minus, C plus, D, and so on. So this, the identification with the ribbon is A plus, A minus, B, C plus, C minus. Yes. And uh, Yes, so, uh, so this is the, uh, that's the, and uh, now let's see, uh, do you see here, the sum of these two roots is equal to the sum of these two roots, yes? So this is a biharmonicity of roots on the ribbon. And the other one is that A minus plus C minus is equal to B. Do you see there? 
This one is like 120 degrees, this one is at 60 in the middle, yes? This is exactly that A minus plus C minus is equal to B on the ribbon, yes? So this is a ribbon, and uh, uh, one more thing here. What is our hexagon? Our hexagon was A plus C. Uh, our hexagon, yes, however, is not on the ribbon. It's better seen here, and it should remind you of the following. So this is on uh, roots, geometrical roots. This is a really fundamental observation now. Where have you seen, let's put it like this, yes. Where have you seen this? Notice that that's exactly what you see on the... If you don't have colors yet, well, we could address that, but uh, I could bring you colors. But where have you seen this pattern? In mathematics books. James, maybe. No, no, but in, in something more concrete than the abstract. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a snake, it's a snake lemma, exactly. You've seen it in, uh, so this is the original version of the snake lemma. I think in Whitehead's topology, he still has snake lemmas which look like a snake. After that, people took only a fragment of this and call it the snake lemma. So this is a snake lemma. Yes, and you see that it's exactly the root system of type uh, of type A3. This is a fundamental part. So the six term exact sequences are exactly uh, the root system of type A2. The uh, snake lemma is the root system of type A3, yes. And the involution operation, which sends uh, an uh, a root into its negative or an object into its negative. Evolution of this type is the is exactly the ribbon if you want of type A1. Yes, so this is important uh, for developing further the mathematics that uh, all these uh, all these uh, uh, <coughs> concepts which were introduced, I think, in algebraic topology also, uh, that they are crystallographic in nature, as shown, uh, shown here. Yes. And so each time you find a six-term exact sequence, it's a, it's a root system of type A2. This is how they appear here, but the, the, uh, the computation is... is uh, uh, fairly tricky with these uh, with these uh, uh, sequences. I must I I checked the uh, uh, reflection, which is a very interesting uh, thing. And you have big multiplicities, but the reflection uh, turns out to appears to use. I I didn't complete yet the proof, but uh, appears to involve the generic kernels, the generic six-term exact sequence. So when you uh, compose uh, these uh, uh, essential paths, you use something called the whole algebra, which was introduced by Ringel, Klaus Ringel. And you basically, you count extensions working over a field with Q elements. So you get polynomials in Q that way. And these polynomials in Q are the uh, coefficients of the quantum group. So this is, so what you really get uh, with this is not uh, 
the uh, classical Lie algebra, but the Q deformation of it with a parameter Q. Once again, the parameter Q appears by counting of the field with Q elements. Now, uh, uh, when you have to reflect, to make reflections, then uh, there are big multiplicities, and what uh, I have checked is that you get, uh, you get to use a generic one. Now, if you count things in linear algebra, now let me give you an example. For instance, you want to know how many uh, bases are there in a two-dimensional space? Yes, this sounds like a reasonable thing, except that if you count it over uh, reals or complex numbers, it doesn't make any sense, right? So you take it over the field with Q elements. Q is some prime. And what you get is that the first vector, so, so the total number of points in uh, a two-dimensional space, is Q square, yes? So the first vector should be non-zero, that is uh, Q square minus one. Possibilities, choices. The second vector should not be on the line of the first vector. So that way you get Q square minus Q. So the total number of choices is Q squared minus one times Q squared minus Q. Now, if you take uh, the vectors up to each of them up to uh, uh, one D scaling, yes, so if you just take the directions of the, of the vectors and you divide each of them by Q minus one and you get Q minus one Q square minus one over Q minus one times Q minus one over Q minus one, you get exactly the, the Q factorial, yes? So whenever you see a Q factorial, it's a number of choosing uh, bases up to uh, scaling each element of the bases. Yes, so this is how you count in this theory. And if you want to obtain the classical limit in this, then you count the generic case. So let's see uh, how many generic ways are there, how many dimensions do you have for choosing a basis in, uh, let's say, in two dimensions or in three dimensions? Well, you have, uh, in two dimensions, you have uh, just two degrees of freedom for the first vector. The zero doesn't matter because you take the generic case. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, and then for the second you uh, you have one, but then up to scaling it remains uh, it remains uh, one. Yes, so it's it's uh, uh, so it's basically the degree of what we had obtained before. Yes, so you you forget the lower order Q terms. So that's how you get the classical limit. You take just a generic case always for these extensions. If you choose extensions with full care, that means that this room is Q to the third, the walls are Q squared, and the corners are one, and so on. Then, uh, then you obtain the Q deformation, which is uh, which is uh, has more information than otherwise. Since we have uh, one minute or zero minutes, I should uh, we should finish. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I will tell just one more sentence. Uh, I will let you think while you pack. Maybe you can tell me. There's a mic. How would you get a root of unity? The reduction to a root of unity when Q, uh, the root of unity negative one. What kind of counting gives you that? Okay, and now the lesson is finished. You come to me while we pack. Here's a hint. The room is three-dimensional, which means Q to the three, which is negative one, yes? The wall is two-dimensional, which is Q square, which is plus one. The, the line is minus one. The point is plus one. What is that? 
That's your other characteristic, exactly. Yes. So it's beautiful. And there are generalized Euler characteristics which work with the other roots of unity, yes? So if you count generically, you get the classical case, yes? If you count it in full, you get the Q deformation. And if you count the Euler characteristic, then you get uh, the roots of unity.